Welcome to Taking Care of Lady Business, where we put the business back in lady business. Hosted by Jennifer Justice, founder and CEO of the Justice Department, a management strategy and law firm that works with female and woke male entrepreneurs, executives, talent, brands, and creatives to build and maximize their wealth, focusing in the areas of tech, consumer product, finance, media, entertainment, and fashion. Jennifer interviews entrepreneurial women who have done it all, who will be sharing their secrets on all things business, especially as a woman. These highly successful women will share strategies and insights, including what not to do and what it takes to win. And now, here's your host, Jennifer Justice. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. I am Jennifer Justice. Today, we have Vanessa Barboni Halleck. She is the founder CEO of Another Tomorrow. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm great and super happy to be here. I know, especially because it's in mid fashion week, by the way, everyone's so the fact that she's doing it. It didn't really occur to me until this morning. I was like, why is she doing my podcast right now? <laughs> I'm, I appreciate it. That's for sure. So maybe there's even some stories you can, you know, anecdotes, things you can tell, given you're in the middle of it. Um, but I do want to talk about, um, obviously, another tomorrow and how you got here. So in short, can you just start with like, where did you start? Because you, de- you didn't start in, you know, fashion retail. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow the, the ending there. Um, so can you tell us how you started? Absolutely. This was a radical uh, pivot. <laughs> so I spent my career, 15 years of it, um, on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley, initially as an options trader. And then I moved into trading and emerging markets and uh, got to build out a bunch of different businesses in that realm. And, um, you know, I think in many ways, this seems uh, like a huge jump, but it kind of pulls all the threads of my background together because I grew up in a very hippie, techie, artistic family. My dad was a professor and an early technologist, really pushed me to learn how to code in high school. And my mom was an artist, made her own clothes, which mortified me as a child. Yeah, (laughs) I know I had that too, yeah. um, Killer, especially small towns in the Midwest, just the absolute worst. But, you know, basically even Wall Street was it was a pretty big aberration from from all of that. But I took a sabbatical in late 2017 because I became really convinced that the way that we allocate capital defines our future. Yeah. And I just like minded. Exactly. Right. That's I mean, it does. Yeah, it really does. So, um, you know, what gets funded is what gets built and what gets built defines uh, defines so much about our our future. And so I'd already started to do some early stage investing in climate tech and material science. Um, and I thought I was going to stay in finance to just do more more of that help direct capital in ways that I thought were really future relevant. And much to my surprise, I completely fell down the rabbit hole of the horror show <laughs> that is the fashion industry. Yeah. It is a beautiful scourge of the earth. And mm-hmm. I was just taken so aback by the magnitude of the problem, the complexity of the problem, the importance of solving it. Um, and I thought that there could be a different vision for this crazy industry. So that's how I got into this. And what I guess leads into the name too of another tomorrow right yeah i mean i'm jumping to conclusions here but probably yeah no. No, the, the name is very much the the purpose and it was funny um i was very lucky i knew one person in all of fashion when i got into this so in hindsight it's like totally bananas um but i was very lucky early on uh to come across melissa goldie who was just coming out of calvin klein um as a cmo there for many years and uh, and she's she's still with us actually as an advisor. And she really pushed me on why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And I said, yeah. because, you know, if we had a choice, we would all choose another tomorrow than the one we're on course for. We would make different decisions and those different decisions would be available to us. And so that's it. You know, it's really comes from a, a vision of an alternate future. And I wanted equally to make sure that it had a name on the door that was going to outlast uh, the founder, outlast the creative director, um, which are in this case what not one and the same, and that was really really important to me that idea of longevity. Amazing. All right. Well, let's talk about what it is. Yeah. So we are both brand and emerging technology platform, which is kind of a unique uh, combination, but certainly been been done before. And really, our purpose is to model the future of fashion. And fundamentally, on the brand side. 
we are essentially an entry luxury brand that really takes farm to closet, um, sorry, farm to table to farm to closet, uh, that leverages technology for transparency and authenticated resale. So everything has been born with a digital twin. And we have now an increasingly demand responsive production uh, capacity as well, which is really exciting. And so really the whole business model is intended to represent uh, a path that others in this industry could take and really intended to kind of give the customer an option to invest in an incredible wardrobe that continue to serve her and can serve others when she's ready to pass it on. So that's another tomorrow, uh, the brand in a nutshell. And it's amazing that we have incredible points of sale now, net forte matches, Bergdorf, Neiman's, et cetera, and equally our, our entire you know authenticated resale platform on our own site as well, which is uh, really kind of one of the first of its kind. And we're a B Corp, which we love. And then the tech side, we're, we're building some really cool stuff in-house uh, with another tomorrow uh, as client number one. And there's going to be some interesting developments on that front as well. And did you start with tech? Like, can you explain like a little bit deeper how like your um, business model is different? Because, you know, like everyone thinks, oh, I want to start a clothing line, right? And it's like, there's obviously a million of them. And I'm always interested in, you know, I find it fascinating the ones that set themselves apart so much more quickly than others and why, you know? So can we talk a little bit more into like how you differentiate from another you know, brand, I don't want to name any, so I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, but it's like, <laughs> no, no, with, with pleasure. I mean, I think interestingly, you know, for me, it really starts with the customer first, you know, and uh, of course I got into this because I really wanted to do something transformative for the industry. But what I saw as the through line for everything that had failed or failed to scale was that, and that was true of, of just pure fashion and definitely true of like sustainable fashion was there wasn't necessarily this appreciation of like meeting the customer where they are and delivering something of value. And so really the overall collection is intended to be something that's deeply in service of the people who buy it uh, and currently mostly women, but certainly not exclusively so. And so it's priced that way. You know, it's the merchandising assortment is uh, reflective of that. And so we really started from, you know, what's missing for her at the outset. So that's really kind of like the merchandising and kind of price positioning. But then in terms of how we seek to differentiate ourselves and and ultimately bring the industry with us is really number one, clothing is an agricultural product or it's made out of plastic. And so we treat it that way. And that means that the impact starts at the fiber origin. So literally we started out by showing up at farms in Tasmania and buying this ethical wool and building our supply chains up from that. And that remains like really our, our North Star. So really taking animal, human, and environmental welfare into account in every decision that we make really from, you know, seed all the way up. The other really is technology. You know, this is an industry that is really linear and, uh, you know, fairly Luddite in some respects. And so we really saw you know, technology is this just infrastructure that could help us to innovate and develop a more circular economy right at the outset. So we were born digital and not just digital in terms of distribution D to C initially, but really digital in terms of every single item that we've ever made has its own unique digital twin. And that's allowed us to tell the story of how those supply chains are built. And it's allowed us to authenticate the product for our authenticated resale platform, make it super easy to resell those clothes, totally transparent and much higher realized value, uh, which is really exciting, has a bunch of other use cases. And now we're doing all kinds of cool stuff that's like pretty unsexy for the customer, but I think really transformative for the industry around really demand responsive production, because in an industry that just produces not just way too much, but also the wrong things, I think that's a huge part of the solution. Wow, there's so many things we have to unpack in that entire like. <laughs> I, this is my Achilles heel. You found my Achilles heel. It's a lot. Well, no, it's like you're doing things so much differently, and you know, I think it also enlightens the fact how, like you said, luddite like the fashion industry is. I, I mean, I remember when Real Real was starting out, and I was like, you know what, like Chanel, YSL, Louis Vuitton should really start a secondhand resale immediately. It's like, oh no, it's not cool. But it's like, I'm sure everyone who works there has also gone and, you know, bought vintage. They missed so much opportunity 
there is unbelievable. I mean, remember, you couldn't even buy a bag online until not that long ago. Totally. Yeah. And this, was, is, and this is the future. This is the future. Yeah. And you, for the under 30 set um, and more, um, this is like in the water, this yeah. idea. Of and in many cases, it's the first preference. And so this is the, this is a new world for brands and it's an exciting one. Yeah. And so let me ask you, when you're talking about a digital twin, can you go and yeah. what do you mean by that exactly? So every single item, every single physical item has its own totally unique digital ID uh, that for us lives in a product cloud. And so if you buy something and you engage with that di digital twin on the care content label, you can see that unique item's entire supply chain. You can repurchase it if you want to do that more often with a t-shirt, or you can activate it, that specific item for resale. And um, so it's a really, really smooth, seamless process. And having the unique digital ID allows for that and ultimately will allow for um, each item to kind of have an, its own unique event structure. So, you know, you pass, maybe you give it to a friend, you know, maybe you sell it to somebody else, like all of those events ultimately get logged. And do you have, which leads me into my next question. Do you have a resale platform that then like I go in, I buy a suit from you I interact, what is it, a QR code or something? That today it's a QR code and we are going to be having an NFC tag in parallel very soon, but today it's a QR code. So we have a QR code. I interact with it. I do have to upload data or anything like that to it. No, it just knows. Okay. And then I want to sell it. What happens then? So you've got two options. So you, let's say you scan that QR code, you put in the care, um, the quality of the item. So let's say that you've been wearing it, but you're taking really good care of it. So it's excellent. So you'll see what our resale price will be. So if you agree with that price, so total, totally transparent, which is something that we found that people really, really wanted. You say, okay, I agree with that. You get a shipping label to your email. So mm -hmm. it comes directly back to us. Now, at that point, you have two, you've got two choices. You can get immediate store credit as long as we agree with the condition. And at that point, we would uh, also have it beautifully ready for the next person to purchase as if it's new. Or if you want cash, you have to wait for it to sell. So okay. immediate store credit, or if you want your cash, it's like the real, real, you have to wait for it to sell. Yeah. But it is, own, it's like the BMW certified pre-owned car yeah. program for fashion. That's how we built it. Right. That is such a good comp. Makes it so much easier to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? The And then the burden becomes back on you, right? Which is great because you're the one who put it out into the, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Ether, atmosphere, et cetera. Okay. So that's amazing. How long have you guys been around? We, we launched very auspiciously at the end of January, 2020, six weeks before the world shut down with COVID. So it's been three and a half wild years, but really good ones. Yeah. But, and also though, weren't, aren't you like, you're really, you know, we haven't got into the type of clothing, but it's, it's a lot of like, you know, things you can wear to work and then day to night and yep. which also a period of time that people were not wearing that stuff. Not so much. That first year was a little daunting <laughs> in terms yeah. of and planning. We made some tough, tough, tough calls, but you know, the, the reasons, uh, you know, the, the calls that we made are the reasons why we're having this conversation in the first place. Otherwise we probably wouldn't be. Right. No, exactly. So, you know, let's get back a little bit into the fact that you knew one person um, when you got into this, like, how is it? Because I think that that this is also a stumbling block for women as well. And when they're starting businesses, well, I don't know anything about it. It's like, well, you're passionate about it. So you're going to find the right people to help you learn about it. Like, yeah. How did you go about doing that? It was literally one foot in front of the other. And it's it's almost hard to think back to that time because I think about how crazy it was. But really, it was, you know, asking friends if they knew people that, you know, and I was pretty specific about what I wanted to learn. And, you know, people were really on board the vision and incredibly generous. And it was really like one connection led to another, led to another. But, you know, I really credit Melissa for having I mean, kind of taught me the ropes in terms of brand building and understanding that infrastructure of, you know, how you actually, you know, build a best in class brand. And then immediately brought on uh, two sustainability experts in the industry who, you know, 
taught me immensely and then I ended up coming in full time in, in two different capacities. So it was one foot in front of the other, truly. But uh, I've had such an incredibly positive experience with this industry that doesn't always get a great rep <laughs> um, yeah. in terms of just the, you know, all the amazing introductions that, that happen in, in pretty short time. Right. No, seriously. Okay. So you, you know, you decide to start this company knowing one person in the end of 2017, you do all this work, but obviously it's not cheap, right? So (laughs) you had to, so how did you fund it? So in the earliest days, uh, I funded it myself uh, because I really wanted to bring the concept to market and demonstrate its commercial viability before bringing in outside capital and having the vision diluted, especially because I'd seen what had happened with an, a lot of very well-intentioned, well-structured D to C companies when they brought in venture funding too early. And so that was the, that was the MO. We ended up raising um, like a kind of a seed pre-seed safe right after we launched um, in the thick of the pandemic. That was my first time raising capital. It was awful. I hated every second of it. <laughs> well, yeah, because what is that story, right? It's like we launched in clothing that nobody's wearing right now. You know, it was, it, you know, it was all like, you know, this is, this is a vision. This is what we're building. This is a, a vision that is an anti-fragile vision, you know, fundamentally, yeah. like, yes, we're in this crazy moment. Um, but this is the vision for how we're going to ultimately transform. And yes, we're going to have to be nimble in the interim. And I, you know, so much credit to those early investors because they made all of this possible. And then we were able, you know, we were able to really demonstrate killer traction that first year between press and distribution and amazing community who supported us and then raised a seed round um, and then uh, did a brief bridge and then a series A. So it's, um, you know, but it's a lot of it has been really figuring out who this is going to organically resonate with. You know, mm-hmm. and it, sometimes that's not necessarily taking the traditional route. You know, so much of investing in early stage is both personal and pattern recognition. And so who are the people and in institutions that have shared values? Who are the people and in institutions that have the pattern recognition of what you're building, having a track record of success in some understandable way? Mm-hmm. And that really helped me both navigate fundraising cycles as well as actually really enjoy the process. Except for the first round, right? (laughs) The first round round was was really, really painful. And I'd never done anything like that before, you know? Right. I mean, you know, we all hear the statistics. It's, you know, 2% of women getting funding. Like how many meetings are you having at this point? Uh, Back then, it was pretty targeted in the very, very earliest stages to people I knew. Yeah. Which were actually the hardest conversations, I think, to have. Yeah. In some way, I felt like, I was asking for something instead of offering an opportunity. And you can mm-hmm. always say an opportunity, who cares, right? So a completely different mindset uh, these days. I love um, that. Can we stop right there for a second? Because absolutely. we talk about this all the time. I was just coaching a female founder this morning who was like, we had had a call last week. Somebody's like, how can I thank them? Can I send them some? I was like, no, 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 we're giving them an opportunity. Okay, yes. we thank them for their time. Like they thank us for our time. And giving them the opportunity, but you cannot go and think that you should like every single person you have a call with, you should be like thanking them, you know, it's like, or giving them something or anything like this is an opportunity here to be in something really great. So I love that you said that. And yes, it's, I think you were about to say like, you're operating out of abundance and not scarcity at that point. A hundred percent. And that was a huge shift for me. Huge yeah shift and by no means did it happen overnight um and I think a lot of it was you know spending time with investors spending time with other founders seeing the value that they saw and that it matched the value that I saw and also just completely depersonalizing it because there are going to be people who for whom that's not their jam and or people for whom the timing isn't right and who cares you offer an opportunity the answer is no like yeah you know again, you thank each other for your time and you move on and it's going exactly. like, totally cool. Yeah. Okay. And I cut you off. Do you remember what you were saying after that? Sorry. 
We were yeah. talking about no fundraising. Idea. I know I cut you off. I know you were going to say something amazing as well, but I'm sure it'll come up again. But we were talking in general about fundraising and how many meetings yeah. you were having and you were really talking. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So yeah, initially, um, pretty, pretty pointy because there were, you know, folks that I knew and, you know, who knew my historical track record and I thought might be genuinely interested in this. Um, the seed round was the opposite. The seed round, I went super wide. And that was kind of the first real institutional push. And that was frustrating because I hadn't figured it out yet, right? Like mm -hmm. the pattern recognition piece wasn't as clear to me. Um, the personal slash institutional values piece wasn't as clear to me. So that was like a highly painful <laughs> protracted learning experience. But I, it's like I had to go through it. You know, yeah. and people tell you these things, and I'm sure who's ever listening to this, like, may or may not hear it and might have to go through it. And, but I, like, I had to go through the gauntlet, I think. And, and I did. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't have known, you know, I wouldn't have known. on and the that, other side. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, like, you know, deeply kind of lived experience. That was also a really painful raise. Our, um, our first creative director passed away, like, right in the middle of it. And that was just, like, from a personal and professional and team perspective, just, I mean, something that you just don't know how to navigate, right? I mean, mm -hmm. just like completely unprecedented. And um, I think the combination of that raise and, and also just, you know, going through that together as a team, you can, speaking to pattern recognition, like you can recognize patterns of problems or you can recognize patterns of resilience. And I think that that's the other piece of the mindset that I've really taken away from the last few years. Speak more to that. What do you mean exactly? It's so easy, you know, I, I have a, a very good founder friend who um, it's like every day is like a high five and a punch in the face. It's like, yeah. both, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's true, right? That's totally true. And, you know, I think that when we want to build and we want to achieve, it's really easy to focus on the things that we could have done better, mm -hmm. the things that went wrong. And so when you do that, you can create this kind of constellation of pain and failure. But what you're not seeing is like all the other stars. You know, you're not seeing all of the moments that you not only triumphed over that thing, but you got so much better, you know? Mm -hmm. and so it's like, or your team did, or you came together, or you figured things out, you grew. And I think for a long time, I, I did live in this kind of like fear-based mode. And so I, I, I had, you know, created these like constellations of, problems and then one day it was kind of like huh there's a completely different pattern here like there's a completely different pattern of resilience if I chose to to see that and then every obstacle that comes up you look at it completely differently instead of like oh my god this is the thing that's going to take us down it's like how are we going to solve for this yeah it's just a complete shift and again that took me quite a while but when you get there it's just it's a super powerful place to be yeah I love yeah. that <laughs> I mean now I'll just keep listening to this episode when I need some inspiration because yes yeah, since like uh, representing only women I feel like you know two steps up on the rung of the ladder and then you know one back down and then two steps oh, up yeah. one back down and you know those wins are so great but sometimes you're just like you know, when you get the calls and it's like, wait, did you really get fired for being pregnant or telling on your boss, you know, your bosses for saying that they're not going to meet their KPIs on purpose or because they don't like your tone, which still happens to women all day long or for, you know, complaining about bad behavior. That's always last week. You know what I mean? Those are the calls I get. And so it can be, it can be like, you know, where are we going in general? But um, if you can sleep well at night, knowing that you're doing something full of purpose and mission and helping the right people, then, you know, that's how then I turn it around. You know, when I get to those, like, oh God, where are we going? You know? And, uh, yeah, it's, it can be tough, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure as all is. And, and I mean, we've got to all work together to make it better. Right. Cause it's, it's True. Network, the network effects are insane. Yeah. When you got yeah, exactly. So yeah. when you were having these these meetings, though, right, where people like, what do you know about fashion? Like, how did you get? I mean, or did anybody ask you that? Like, you know, it's interesting. I, I didn't get that as much. And I think that that's because, you know, in the world of venture, there is so much 
that's like new frontier. I think where I got it was like more private equity investors, mm -hmm. which makes sense, right? Like they're much more focused on the operating side of the business. Um, but it's sort of interesting that I didn't get that more. And, and I think venture does kind of allow for some of that, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, I've certainly learned a ton about the industry along the way. And so arguably people could have asked <laughs> a few more times in the early days, but you know, there's a beautiful, you know, I think there's a be there's a beautiful trust, I think, in founders who are going to figure it out, you know, knowing that um knowing that they will. So that was that was interestingly like not a major, not a major thing. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. So and then when you're talking about, you know, the future of another tomorrow and growth, like what does that look like? You know, we believe, I deeply believe that for us to succeed in our mission of really modeling the future of fashion, we need to be incredibly commercially successful. And otherwise, like everything that we're doing is just like cute, you know, yeah. oh, that's cute. That's nice. Like, you know, small niche brands can do that, but these are not things that are applicable to the wider industry. And so sustainable scale, both economically as well as impact is something that's really important to us. And part of that's going to be geography. So we already have direct to consumer customers in over 56 countries, which is pretty cool. And so that's really exciting for us to see that kind of scale of product market fit. And, you know, we really want to continue to go deeper in tech and circularity in ways that, you know, not only lifts up our business model, but, but potentially others as well. Do you have a tech that people can white label? Um, I like other fashion brands, so they don't have to build it from scale because that's the, could be the, you know, issue. And as we know, they're all Luddites. So it's like, how would they even be able to do that? We we're creating some tools that we think could eventually add some value for others. Right. So. Because it would seem much more and easily scalable by doing those kinds of things. Yeah. Amazing. And so you know, you obviously worked the majority of your career for someone else, right? Yes. And then here you are. I know sometimes I'm just like, I could do anything I wanted today, you know, regardless of the fact that I have clients, it's just like, you know, I could go anywhere, be anywhere. You know, it's a little bit different when you have retail stores and all of that and team, but it's like, you know, with that big shift, how do you like, are there things that motivate you or things that you did right? You know what I mean? That are different than when you're at a big company, like, you know, speak to that transition a little bit. So when people are considering this, they understand. Yeah, it was interesting. Well, the first thing that I noticed is a lot of the things that I used to blame on my old corporate job are actually totally on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, work-life balance, you know, boundaries, waking up at the crack of dawn, uh, all things that I ostensibly could have blamed on working at an investment bank and did are apparently things that I just totally have replicated for myself and my own company. So that is like just some personal ownership. Um, what really was a big shift, and it happened about uh, six, nine months before I decided to start this company was my meditation practice. Um, and that was something that I didn't have when I was in finance, and I think would have helped me immensely. And so now it's like, you know, vague meditations, like brushing my teeth. And that to me is just incredibly grounding. And I think has allowed me to also, um, in my better moments, kind of zoom out for myself and be able to kind of observe, you know, your emotions and your behaviors in a way that you're not just totally sucked in. Um, so that's been the biggest, really, that's been the biggest shift. And, you know, equally, it's been a beautiful thing to, and I feel hugely privileged to work with our team and to build this culture and, and, uh, and co-create it with them, which is something that I had to, you know, to a degree before. And was one of the reasons why I really realized that I liked building, uh, was the experience I had at Morgan Stanley, but obviously it's different when you're literally starting from a completely, completely blank slate. Exactly. No, it's true. It's really interesting. All those habits that you still had, no matter what. So yeah, I completely relate. I am not a wake up at dawn person. I never have been my entire life. So, <laughs> but I would love to reverse it. I am awake at four without an alarm, like clockwork and it kills me. It kills me, but yeah. Some people are fine with it. Some are not. It's crazy. I don't even know what camp I'm in anymore. It's just automatic. So well, you're, you're in the founder not, camp. So now you can't even, yeah, you can't blame anybody. Yeah, exactly. Because either way you're screwed, you know? 
Um, okay, so uh, I know that we can't keep you here forever. So people want to find another tomorrow. How do they do that? Uh, a few different ways. So your favorite social media um, uh, at another tomorrow. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, another tomorrow.co on the web. Super easy. And if you love your same day delivery, um, one of several good options is Net-A-Porte. Amazing. And you have retail stores? We don't at the moment. We've had two incredible pop-ups and we've got one uh, permanently on the horizon for next year. Oh, amazing. Look at that. Did you do pop-ups just in New York or in other places? We've done two in New York and then we've done events elsewhere. Um, and uh, we're really excited about building a permanent home and hopefully not too long. Well, that is, I mean, that is something to consider, right? It's like, we all know what commercial real estate is like. We saw so many things go away and commercial real estate is so hot. And then now you're seeing things pop back up, you know, as physical store locations, right? Because you do want to feel it and touch it, et cetera. Totally. Yeah. I mean, net a porter net makes it really easy to send back. So that's good. Too. <laughs> but, we, no. well. we have amazing customer service, or at least we like to think so. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So um, I ask everybody this one question on the podcast always, and I was so interested to see, hear what you have to say on this, but what is the worst advice you've ever received? You know, I have turned this over and over and over again, and I think it's come in so many forms of largely people articulating their own lessons and me trying to fit myself into their narratives, uh, as opposed to really looking at what my vision is, not just for a business, but also for my life. I think I followed just infinite different threads of advice, trying to make other people happy, trying to follow that other right path without, without actually asking myself the question of where am I trying to go? Who am I trying to be? How am I trying to show up? And that was also pretty recent reflection. Otherwise, you know, you end up chasing yeah. you know, all these different ideas that could be perfectly suited for somebody else, but actually don't apply to who you are and where you're going. Yeah, I know I can relate with that very much. I had kids on my own. I'm the first one to ever go to college. Like I did all the things opposite of everybody, what they told me that I needed to do. <laughs> so I get it, but it does come down to a lot of it. And this is a part of, and people say it all different ways, but trusting your instinct, trusting your gut, no, it's good for you. And, you know, you are one of many who have said that, you know, sometimes they didn't, they did listen to their gut. Sometimes they didn't. And they were found out they were like people pleasing and not really like authentically living their life and who they are, you know, and the sooner we we realize those things, um, we're always going to mess up. We're always going to do that. Like, can't help it. We're as women, we're served ads all day long and how we should look, how we should dress, who we should be, et cetera. I think that the height of a girl's confidence is eight years old, you know, and then they start questioning everything about themselves, you know, and I can see it having a young girl who's 10 and a boy, you know, it's crazy. So it's a very common thread. And I think it never hurts to co re continue to say it and repeat it. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I so appreciate you being on uh, the podcast, especially during Fashion Week, as you have a fashion brand. And uh, I'm so glad that we got an opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. So it's, it's been a huge pleasure and I'm, I'm a big, big fan. Thank you. And to everyone listening, thank you for listening to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. Until next week, I'm Jennifer Justice. 49 faces look to him in triumph. Over the last 12 months, they had each taken turns and promoted his business for a week at a time, driving over $987,342 in revenue. What if you had a network of 50 centers of influence who promoted your business every week for a year? Grab your copy of the number one Amazon best-selling book, The Ultimate Guide to Growing Your Business with a Podcast, at 33% off the Amazon price by going to ultimatepodcastbook.com. Again, that website for 33% off the Amazon price is ultimatepodcastbook.com.